This episode sponsored by Great Horses Plus. Hello and welcome history buffs. My name is Nick Hodges and in this episode we'll be marching on Rome. It seems rather fitting that after two years of this channel being around that I cover one of my most requested television series. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is a series that follows the rise of Julius Caesar, the civil wars that followed, the transition between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. It's a show of Goliath proportions, so epic in fact that it tries to cover 20 years of history, but within only two seasons. As you can imagine, much of that history is condensed down or omitted entirely, sadly much of it because of its extremely premature cancellation. But despite all this, it still has a hardcore fan base, one that I'm proud to be a part of. So, I would like to present a True History Buffs video for True History Buffs. This is Rome. If you ask anyone in the general public to name you a famous Roman, then no doubt they'll say Julius Caesar. But unless they're a history buff, that is likely where their knowledge will end. The sheer scope of his life was vast, and it's difficult to get an impression of the man himself without doing extensive research. HBO's Rome picks up his story in 52 BC, at the moment of his greatest triumph, after Caesar just won the Battle of Alesia and defeated Vercingetorix, king of all the Gauls. Gaul, known today as France, has been mostly pacified and is now a new added province of the Roman Empire. The citizens of Rome are enthralled with Caesar's victory, his popularity greater than ever. But the same cannot be said with the Senate, the ruling body of Roman power. I have a question concerning your friend and co-consul, the darling of Venus, Gaius Julius Caesar. Why does his chair remain empty? Why does he not come home? His illegal war is over. Therefore, I move that Caesar's governorship in Gaul be terminated immediately, that his armies be disbanded, and that he be recalled to Rome to answer charges of illegal warfare, theft, bribery, and treason. Okay, so the general gist of the scene shows that most of the Senate is pissed with Caesar. The reasons are accurately given, but viewers who are unfamiliar with Roman history are not given context for exactly why. And it's all because of how much history has to be condensed down for the purpose of plot. So what I'm going to do is to try and give you context, so you might understand what has led up to this moment since the show is unable to do so. I can start by pointing out that Caesar was not co-consul with Pompey at this time, nor was he ever, regardless of what Cato has just said. Now a consul was the highest elected position in the Senate, effectively its leader. However, in the Roman Republic, there was never one consul, but two. Each shared power, and they only held it for a single year. Once they had, they couldn't run for the position of consul again for another 10 years. The idea behind this was that so no single man could hold on to too much power, as Romans detested the idea of kings and tyrants. Julius Caesar became consul in 59 BC. His co-consul was a man called Marcus Bibulus, a politician expected to oppose and counter Caesar's radical reforms and proposals. Reason for this was that despite Caesar's aristocratic background, he was not loved amongst the nobility. A senator in those days was expected to maintain the status quo for the privileged elite at the expense of everyone else. Pretty much how today's senators function. All fellow members of the Roman Senate, hear me. Shall we continue to build palace after palace for the rich? Or shall we aspire to a more noble purpose and build decent housing for the poor? How does the Senate vote? Fuck the poor! So Caesar was basically rocking the apple cart as a reformer. Rome at that time had a problem with his agriculture sector that led to massive unemployment. Low-income plebeians and small landowners were being bought out or driven off their land by latifundia, great farming estates similar to mega plantations. These lands would now be cultivated by slaves, and the plebeians were now flocking to the cities to try and seek employment, leading to overpopulation. These latifundia, getting stinking rich in the process, had much of the Roman Senate in their pockets, having them obstruct any social or economic change that might challenge their position, and this included Julius Caesar. However, Caesar had a special alliance with two of Rome's most influential senators. Gnaeus Pompey Magnus, a hero of the Republic, and considered one of its greatest generals. And then there was Marcus Licinius Crassus, 
one of the richest men in Roman history, bankrolling Caesar's political career. This alliance was known as the First Triumvirate, and had challenged the Senate's grip over Roman politics. Most notably was Caesar's land reform bill, which proposed to buy unused land from willing Latifundia and having them only be cultivated by Roman citizens, veterans, or freed men, allowing thousands of the urban poor to leave the cities and back into the Italian countryside. The land reform bill was passed, and throughout the year, the Senate and Caesar's co-consul Bibulus tried to block his proposals at every turn, but with little success. Caesar's popularity and influence were simply too strong, and towards the end, the Senate just wanted to be rid of him. Traditionally, when a consulship was over, that consul was awarded a single province to govern. Getting two provinces was a rarity, but Caesar managed to get himself three. Illyricum, Cisalpine Gaul, and Transalpine Gaul. He was also given four legions to protect them. Out of his own pocket, Caesar raised two additional legions, giving him command of around 30,000 men. Now a quick thing to know is that Cisalpine Gaul and Transalpine Gaul marked one of Rome's northern borders. The territory beyond it to the northwest was collectively known as Gaul, and it was home to numerous Celtic tribes which, although independent from Rome, still retained a diplomatic relationship with them. Early into Caesar's first year as governor in 58 BC, an Alpine Gallic tribe known as the Helvetii were migrating to resettle in Western Gaul. Up to 300,000 of them were heading for Caesar's province. This would mark the beginning of the Gallic Wars. Now in the interest of time, I'm going to have to condense down a lot of stuff, but hopefully you'll get an idea of why many in the Senate hated Caesar, and it had a lot to do with what he did in Gaul. So right from the beginning, Caesar opposed the Helvetii's migration and defeated them in battle. Shortly afterwards, many Gallic tribes reached out to Caesar, congratulating him for his victory. But they then requested his military support against a foreign German king called Ariovistus, whose tribe the Suebi had settled in Gaul. The tricky thing is that Ariovistus had achieved official recognition by the Senate and was considered a friend of Rome. But there was also an old Roman law that encouraged governors of Transalpine Gaul to defend their Gallic allies allies who were now being threatened by the Suebi. These two official mandates conflicted with one another, and whatever course Caesar took, he'd be pissing someone off. In the end, Caesar took his legions, marched against Ariovistus, and crushed the Suebi in battle, and emerged victorious once again. Within just his first year as governor, Caesar had won two military campaigns, and one of them had been against an official friend of Rome. Not long afterwards, Caesar raised two more legions without the Senate's approval, doubling his forces to eight. Needless to say, there was much grumbling in the Senate about this. In 57 BC, Caesar began yet another military campaign, this time against Gallic tribes to the northeast called the Belgae. Rumours had circulated that they were conspiring against Rome, disturbed by its ever-growing military presence in Gaul. Caesar launched a preemptive strike against the Belgae, laying waste to their lands as he advanced. Much of that year was spent fighting skirmishes until a decisive battle was fought at the Sambre River. The Belgic tribes came close to overwhelming the Romans, but thanks to their military discipline, the legions recovered and massacred the Belgae. With this victory, Caesar grew in confidence and asserted Roman authority in Gaul more than ever. His reasons for seeking out war became less and less justified as he kept securing victory after victory. The booty and slaves he procured during his campaigns made him rich and popular with the Roman people. Another tribe that came into Caesar's crosshairs was the Veneti who lived in the Brittany Peninsula. A Roman garrison nearby had been demanding supplies of grain from the local tribes, much to their resentment. When the Veneti captured some of Caesar's officers, he took this provocation as an act of war. As the Veneti were a seafaring people, he commissioned a fleet to challenge them. Despite having superior ships, the Gallic fleet was subdued by the Romans, and Caesar had all the Veneti nobles put to death. The rest of the population was enslaved as a warning to other Gauls in the region. It didn't help much, as local uprisings occurred, but these were also put down. Now, no doubt you're beginning to see a pattern emerge. Caesar is no longer fighting to protect Rome's borders. He's cutting a bloody path through Gaul and warring on its people with little justification. To the Roman people, Caesar is a hero. But to many in the Senate, he was viewed as a rogue general. This war of Caesar's is a crime. He's waging war on behalf of Rome. We commissioned him to fight the Gauls. Not all of them! He started fighting the insurgents at the borders and moved on to murder peaceful Roman allies Gauls who paid taxes and tribute to Rome. I fear the gods, gentlemen. 
Caesar is not Sulla. He's not fighting the Romans. He's fighting the Gauls. He's not threatening us. We are threatening him. When Caesar was consul, how many times did he push through a law without having it ratified? He has no respect for us. Something had better be done. In 55 BC, Caesar made the most audacious move in his career yet, by leading an expedition to invade the island of Britain. He claimed that the Veneti and Belgae had received support from the Britons for their campaign against Caesar. With the same fleet he'd used to crush the Veneti, he set sail. Now this new campaign of Caesar's truly captured the Roman public's imagination. They knew little to nothing of Britain. It was a mysterious place on the edge of the known world, wrapped in myth and legend. Many Romans didn't even believe it existed. So to hear of Caesar's exploits in Britain and its strange natives was something truly extraordinary. It was like landing on another planet. But apart from cementing Caesar's celebrity status, nothing much was accomplished. His first expedition failed, as well as his second in 54 BC. No further attempt to conquer Britain would be made until nearly a century later. While Caesar was away in Britain, things went from bad to worse. In September 54 BC, Caesar received a letter stating that his daughter Julia had died in childbirth. Aside from the personal loss, this also threatened the first triumvirate since Caesar's daughter was the wife of Pompey Magnus. Then a few months later, a major uprising had begun in Gaul. Discontent amongst the subjugated tribes was reaching a breaking point, and shortly after, in 53 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus died fighting the Parthians effectively ending the first triumvirate. Let me put it like this, his financial backer was dead, his only child was dead, and as a result, so was his alliance to the one man who could protect him from his enemies in the Senate, enemies who would later seduce Pompey to join their side. And then, in 52 BC, all the tribes had united under a single king called Vercingetorix, a charismatic and capable leader who was familiar with how the Romans fought. He knew that they couldn't be defeated in open battle, so he devised another way, through scorched earth. Vercingetorix avoided Caesar's legions as best he could, and at the same time, he burned all the farms and crops, denying Caesar any opportunity to feed his men. And with their supplies dwindling, it was beginning to work. Caesar then had to make a decision, to either abandon Gaul and everything he fought for, and return to Roman shame, taking his chances with the Senate or to double down and pacify Gaul, which was the choice he went with. At first, the Gaul's tactics seemed to be working, but eventually, Caesar cornered Vercingetorix and 60,000 of his men in the hilltop fortress of Alesia. Despite being low on food themselves, the Romans decided to starve them out. They did this by building a massive wall around the town, up to 11 miles long. Throughout construction, the Gauls launched constant raids against the Romans. Eventually, Gaulic cavalry was able to punch through the defences and escaped. Caesar knew that they would be back with reinforcements. So he began works on a second wall. This one would be 14 miles long. The first wall kept Vercingetorix and his men in, and the second would keep the Gaulic reinforcements out. As the weeks rolled by, food started running out for the Gauls. In an effort to keep his army fed, Vercingetorix expelled all the women and children from Alesia, hoping they would be allowed to pass through the Roman lines. It didn't work. Caesar refused passage to the refugees, and Vercingetorix wouldn't take them back. Confined between the two armies, they slowly starved. In late September, the Gallic reinforcements had arrived, numbering in the tens of thousands. Combined with Vercingetorix's forces in Alesia, Caesar's 60,000 troops faced over 200,000 Gauls. As soon as the relief army assaulted the outer wall, Vercingetorix attacked from the inside, trapping the Romans. For days, they fended off constant attacks that chipped away at their defenses. On the brink of collapse, Caesar made one last effort to seize the day. Breaking through the lines, he led his cavalry around the outer walls and attacked the Gauls from the rear. Inspired by the sight, the Roman infantry pushed on into the heart of the Gauls. It was a slaughter. Attacked from both sides, the Gauls broke and fled the battlefield. After eight years, the most important battle in the Gallic Wars had been won. The next day, Vercingetorix rode into Caesar's camp and surrendered. Shortly after, all the tribes followed his example. By the very end, Caesar had slaughtered a million Gauls and enslaved a million more. Caesar sent word back to Rome of his victory. Gaul had finally been pacified a new addition to the empire. 
Which brings us back to the start of this chapter, as episode 1 of HBO's Rome begins after the Battle of Alesia, where we see the Roman Senate squabble over what was to be done with Caesar. I hope I've given you enough context to understand why they hated him so much, out of fear. He contradicted them, he undermined them, and he threatened everything they stood for. Corrupt and decadent it may have been, they stood for the Republic. Were they right to fear Caesar? Absolutely. Emboldened by his victory and bolstered by his loyal legions, Caesar marched on Rome itself, sparking off civil wars that would rock the empire to its core. He overturned the old ways of government and proclaimed himself dictator for life. But even that wasn't enough. Caesar even went as far as to assert himself as a divine ruler. At his triumph, he painted his face red like the god Jupiter. The foundations of a new cult to worship him was laid. It was called Jupiter Julius or Divus Julius. Even a new month was named after him, the month of July. Eventually it became too much for his enemies in the Senate. In 54 BC on the Ides of March, they stabbed him 23 times and Caesar died. But the damage had already been done. The Roman Republic was dying and the age of the emperors was about to begin. I would just like to say thanks to Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video. If you're interested in learning more about the Romans, I would recommend getting a subscription. If you do, definitely check out Understanding Greek and Roman Technology with Stephen Ressler. He gives an in-depth analysis on ancient technology, weaponry, warships, and even the construction of the Parthenon, science and technology that still resonates with us to this day. Great Courses Plus is an on-demand video learning service with exclusive lectures and courses from top professors of Ivy League universities and other prestigious institutions. They also have experts from places like National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America. With over 7,000 lectures, you'll be able to learn on any device at your own pace, all from the comfort of your own home. To start your one-month free trial, just enter thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash history buffs or click on the link in the description box below. So now that I've given you some historical context, I'm going to go over some of my likes and dislikes with Rome. For the most part, this show is brilliant and you can really tell they made an effort with the history. However, it's more historically authentic than it is historically accurate, and that's to be expected when you're trying to condense down eight years of history into a single season. It's a very hard thing to do, and I think they pulled it off very well. Speaking of which, if you live in the UK and you haven't seen Rome yet, please don't watch it on Netflix. You might notice that season one only has 10 episodes, but on DVD it has 12. And the reason why is because Rome is a co-production between the BBC and HBO. But unlike HBO's version, the BBC decided to sloppily re-edit the first three episodes. According to Michael Apted, the director of those episodes, he said, and I quote, I'm really pissed off with the BBC for bringing down my first three episodes into two, and in doing so, taking out much of the vital politics. It also makes me very grumpy as I was told that the cuts have been introduced by the BBC because they thought British viewers already knew the historical background. But all that's happened, as far as the viewer is concerned, is that's made Rome hard to follow. And, uh, yeah, he's absolutely right. By taking out all those vital talky bits, the BBC reduced Rome into an incoherent mess. And what's with the bullshit justification? Brits know more about Roman history than Americans do, so they don't need to watch it. I mean, wow, how arrogant is that? I really think on this occasion we know what the BBC stands for. <laughs> So anyway, like I was saying, Rome's strengths are built from authenticity rather than accuracy, and it's the tiny details that truly sell it. A perfect example of this would be episode one. Although not a great representation of the Battle of Alesia, most likely due to budget constraints, two things really stood out to me. One is we see the Romans portrayed in the actual armor they wore in Caesar's day. Far too often in movies and TV shows, we see Romans always wear Lorica Segmentata armor, Unlike in the 2001 movie Vercingetorix, they wouldn't be wearing it until 100 years later. In HBO's Rome, they're wearing Lorica Hamata armor, which is 100% correct. Secondly, we see how the Romans actually fought and understand why they were so effective on the battlefield.
This strategy is based on the account of a Roman historian called Titus Livius, or Livy for short. He described how the front lines would rotate in battle. The man in the front line thrusts his enemy back with his shield and stabs him with his short sword. But he can only do that for a limited length of time, perhaps six minutes. The man behind pushes forward to take his place, and then he becomes the front line. He then takes up the fighting while the man who is being relieved goes to the back of the line. And this repeats and repeats and repeats. If you have eight ranks deep, you fight every 40 minutes. Wow, that makes perfect sense and it's really cool to watch. So why do so many movies have Romans break formation and fight in free-for-alls? I mean, like, even Gladiator is guilty of this cliché. Thankfully, Rome shows us why it's not a good idea to do that. Get back in formation, you drunken fool! Reform! Another thing Rome pulls off is the look of Rome. Uh, no, I'm not talking about the look of the show, I mean the city itself. When the average person thinks of Rome, they imagine glorious white marble buildings and statues, because that's what these relics and ruins look like today. But back then, they were awash with exotic colours. Buildings were painted, statues were painted, just like you see here. We get a real sense of what this vibrant city looked like. They even go as far as to cover the walls with penis graffiti, which was absolutely true. This was a pre-Christian society without the modern scruples we have today. Nudity and sexuality wasn't shameful, it was well accepted and often encouraged. It's clear that the creators of Rome made a great effort to make this world come to life. We want the show to be as historically authentic as we can possibly make it. And the distinction there for me is that while the characters are dramatized characters, the world in which they're moving, the context in which they exist, was something that we could flesh out with historical detail. Speaking of characters, let's discuss everyone's favorites. We have Lucius Verinus, the stoic career soldier with strict values of Roman conduct. Soldier! You were on duty. And my personal favorite, Titus Pullo, the insubordinate soldier with a heart of gold. Is that it? Right, back on you go. One thing I was surprised to find out about these two is that they're not 100% fictional. In Julius Caesar's memoirs, The Commentaries of the Gallic Wars, he briefly mentions two soldiers called Lucius Verinus and Titus Pullo. Unlike the show, they were both centurions, and they hailed from the 11th legion and not the 13th, but we don't know much about them. They were the only common soldiers named by Caesar personally, and apparently they had a rivalry with each other over who was the bravest. Their fictional counterparts might have been used to introduce the audience to the world of the plebeians, so we could see how the other side lives, which is absolutely fine with me and besides, they're wonderfully written characters. So these are just quick examples of what I really love about Rome. I could go on all day, but I thought it'd be fair to include some minor criticisms I have with the show as well. One thing I think every fan can agree with is the severe lack of battle sequences. The only one we really get is the Battle of Alicia, and it's over in a heartbeat. Apart from that, every major battle in Caesar's Civil War is glossed over, and understandably it's because it would have been really expensive. But it's still infuriating, I mean just take a look at the Battle of Pharsalus. Because you're really invested with what's going on. They've been building up to this climactic showdown between Julius Caesar and Pompey for a while now, and you're pumped. You can't wait to see him kick his ass. But then it cuts to some blurry handheld shots of a few soldiers fighting, and before you even realize it, it cuts back to Caesar approaching his bed, sitting down, and then he says, Send to Rome. Tell them Caesar has won. Wait, what? Are you kidding me? All that build up for nothing? I mean, I know we shouldn't bitch about it because we're here for the drama, but imagine if they cut out all the battle scenes from Game of Thrones. The dark arts have provided Lord Stannis with his armies and paved his path to our door. And tonight, I believe you are the only man who can stop him. The battle is over. We have won. Yeah. You'd be pissed too. That's not even mentioning all the other battles they cut in season one. Not gonna go over them all, but here's a quick list. <laughs> but 
But anyway, whatever. It doesn't really ruin anything for me. Yet for a show that tries to be as historically authentic as possible, it does make some rather strange choices, like perpetuating a very old Roman misconception. There's a court of talent there for bribes and such. Spend it wisely. So. For some reason, we see characters performing the Roman salute, a gesture which supposedly Roman soldiers held at their right hand or arm as a military courtesy. But it is generally accepted that there is no single Roman text or work of art that describes or shows the Romans ever making such a salute. The closest examples we have don't look anything like the Roman salute we know, such as the marbled statue of Augustus, where he's either pointing or meant to be holding something, or Trajan's column, where no coordinated salute can be found. Apparently, this misconception originates from a neoclassical painting by Jacques-Louis David called The Oath of the Horatii. Well, that about wraps it up for part one of my Rome review. I hope you enjoyed it, and stay tuned for part two when it comes out. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching, History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. If you wish to support History Buffs, then you can now do so at Patreon. And as always, let me know in the comments section what you thought about Rome. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? In the meantime, check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook page for new updates. Until then, I'll see you next time.